In the mid-1960s, my generation was tuning in, turning on, and dropping out of society. With incredible luck, I headed home from a war to find the bride of my dreams, eager to start generating a nuclear family. Hello and welcome. My name is Raymond Schaff, and I'm the author of Confessions of a Level 9 Nerd. Please buy a copy at Amazon.com and then read it. Then, the next time you check into a motel, wait until about 10 p.m. or so and take my book down to the night clerk and give it to him or her. Thank them for working such an awful shift and advise them to read one chapter a night to keep a smile on their face while managing the complex. Could help. I have included a list of requirements for being a level 1 through level 9 nerd at the end of the video for those of you who are interested. Also, near the end of this video is a stupid smart explanation of how to create a chart in Microsoft Excel using a single keystroke. It's guaranteed to put a smile on the lips of any respectable computer nerd. Now let's take off into Confessions of a Level 9 Nerd, Chapter 5. Leaving the war and going nuclear. I peered out of my porthole window watching ribbons of heat waffling up from the tarmac. Their brief upward passages distorted the Vietnamese jungle foliage surrounding the runway. Orange bands of late afternoon sunlight ricocheted off our gleaming jetliner's body only to be absorbed into the impenetrable jungle. This was an ominous reflection of the ongoing Vietnam War experience, where the brightness of humanity fought its way into the twisted darkness of hate. Four turbines whistled their monotone harmonies as our airliner crept down the tarmac guided by two narrow white stripes leading to a way out of the maelstrom. The pilot clearly understood his cargo of young U.S. Army veterans, each carrying a heavy load of experiences, were eager for the ultimate uplifting experience of going home. A scene played out in each of their minds countless times. The pilot taxied around the final turn and commanded the four casually whistling turbines to break out into a rousing barbershop quartet performance. Hurtling towards the end of the runway, the powerful quartet broke out into a spectacularly loud song of freedom that crushed us down into our cushioned seats. The jetliner lurched upward at such a steep angle that I felt my dog tag sliding up towards my throat. I strained to look out my porthole window and watched as South Vietnam faded into my memory. And then I fell back into my seat, wishing that the pilot could somehow force more jet fuel into the thundering engines. The big Boeing powered its way up into the purple heavens until we reached an altitude that put us out of harm's way. It was only then that I was able to cover my eyes and for the first time in a full year, exhale. The times were indeed changing 
As the onset of the fall season began cooling down the 1967 Summer of Love, the irony of the pop song, Are You Going to San Francisco?, crackled from the airline's overhead speakers as we flew high over the Pacific Ocean towards California, made for an ultimate trip for everyone on board, to use the vernacular of the day. The most exhilarating flight of our lives stretched into a dozen or so hours, hurtling under the inky stratosphere towards America. The tiny dot on the edge of the Pacific Ocean grew into Travis Air Force Base in Northern California. With its outstretched ribbons of concrete runways, the only thing that greeted us back to a civilized world. The long journey of leaving the war behind and learning how to survive the war of words had only just begun. Our military transport bus provided shelter as we whisked across level, paved roads for the first time in a year. We eventually passed through the city of Berkeley, California, where we were greeted by a group of highly excited college students, mostly my age, only quite a bit younger, who were using their fingers to digitally communicate with us. They were jumping up and down with patriotic joy, wearing clothing made from pieces of American flags. They flashed us the V for victory sign and raised a single metal finger straight up in the air indicating that we were number one in their books. Their unique way of welcoming us home was unforgettable. I didn't want to disappoint them, so I acknowledged their thoughtful recognition of our homecoming by returning the same finger gestures through our military bus's window. It was a moving time for me. I truly believed I effectively communicated with that group of students, so high on life as we headed to the right, leaving them far to the left of us for the remainder of our divided lives. After a month's rest and recuperation in my beloved San Francisco Bay Area, I headed to my next duty assignment at the New Cumberland Army Depot in Pennsylvania. New Cumberland was a sleepy little town that rested comfortably on the edge of the Susquehanna River and was literally a stone's throw away from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. The U.S. Army Depot was almost as big as the city of New Cumberland itself and gobbled up the town's southern border. Forested hills surrounded the military supply depot, hiding a beehive of activities that pushed trainload after trainload of war material into the mouth of the ravenous Vietnam War. My new Vietnam veteran credentials opened the door to the base's computer center, establishing me to work alongside with civilian employees in the computer operations division. After 12-hour shifts for a year with no days off, the depot's eight-hour swing shift with weekends and holidays off seemed like a vacation to me. The Computer Operations Center included a matching pair of Univac 1005 computing systems that barked like M60 machine guns when in full operation. To complement the system, we had a room full of peripheral support equipment designed to feed the Iron Beasts their daily rations of ones and zeros. Several IBM mainframes secret away in an adjacent operations room were part of an obscure ARPANET project 
that created some of the basic support framework for what we now call the Internet. I was 21 years old and all of my brain cells were firing simultaneously, attempting to absorb every bit of computing knowledge that crossed my path. After several months of non-stop, on-the-job cramming sessions, I found myself operating multiple pieces of computing equipment concurrently. I felt guilty doing almost everyone's job on the swing shift, but my civilian co-workers convinced me that it was the 1960s and it was okay to tune into my digital desires, turn on the machines, and let my co-workers drop out of sight. Peace, harmony, and love abounded everywhere. Not all was lost. While working at the depot, I attended a USO-sponsored dance and met the most beautiful 19-year-old girl I had ever seen in my 21 years of life. Sparks flew, resulting in all my internal circuit boards unable to resist her. So we created a permanent connection, keeping the power constant throughout multiple generations. My discharge date was closing in on me when I spotted a job announcement pinned on the sprawling Army Depot's main bulletin board. The first thing I noticed about the job description was that the pay was five times more than I was currently earning and the newly created position practically guaranteed a career in high tech. The flyer detailed how the Pennsylvania Metropolitan Edison Company's multi-million dollar nuclear power plant project would generate hundreds of long-term high-paying jobs. The primary construction site was located on an island in the middle of the Susquehanna River just across from my base, the New Cumberland Army Depot. The big utility was recruiting for control room operations personnel to work down inside the bowels of their state-of-the-art computerized nuclear power plant control center. The job bulletin also indicated that the new positions included extensive power plant control room operations training prior to the startup of the twin nuclear reactor units. To top it off, the company offered a hiring preference for returning Vietnam veterans. The offer of employment by the giant utility was indeed enticing. But the call of silicon proved to be greater than the power of the atom as I headed west, back to the future of computing. My decision to bypass a career in computerized nuclear power plant operations haunted me for several years until the day I turned on a live national TV news emergency broadcast coming from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. The entire nation looked on as the bundled nuclear fuel rods that made up the core of reactor unit number two at the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant were melting. I watched with more interest than most as some of the overhead aerial shots of the failing nuclear power plant also included brief glimpses of the New Cumberland Army Depot situated across the river from the facility. It was then that I realized how close I came to literally becoming a glowing example of the nuclear power industry. And now it's time to unlock my wall safe for a safe off the wall story.
Following my tour of duty in South Vietnam, I was ordered to a U.S. Army base near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Because I was a returning Vietnam veteran, I was assigned to be a member of the base's military burial team whenever the request for services arose. The Vietnam War was raging on at full speed, which meant every couple of weeks our team would pack up into passenger vans and travel to churches and graveyards in order to provide military burial honors for American soldiers, almost always young Vietnam veterans. My first burial detail took us to a tiny town deep in the rolling hills of eastern Pennsylvania, taking several hours to drive from our base. Our large van pulled up next to a combination bar motel to check in for the follow morning's burial ceremony. I took note of a group of six or seven men hanging around outside the bar, giving us cold, hard stares as we pulled in to park. When the first few members of our team popped open the van's huge sliding side door and jumped out to stretch their legs from the long trip, the men giving us the hard looks took off running away, disappearing into the recesses of the small town. Apparently, they spotted several team members coming out of the van carrying M14 rifles for the upcoming ceremony and decided it was time to leave the area. The following morning, after attending the funeral service in a local church, we accompanied the deceased young Vietnam veteran's body to a small cemetery just outside of town. During the ceremony, I was supposed to perform the final fold of the United States flag that had covered the casket, then pivot to our team commander. He would take the folded flag from my hands and present it to the mother of the deceased soldier. I pivoted too far and stopped directly in front of the mother and stared into her tear-filled eyes. I stood paralyzed for a moment, unable to look away, before bending down towards her while gently handing her the freshly folded American flag and struggled to utter a few words about how sorry I was for her loss. I saluted her and the neatly folded flag she held in her arms and pivoted back towards my team, realizing that I had totally screwed up by not presenting the flag to our team commander. I stepped back two steps, giving the team commander room to kneel down in front of the mother and add his memorized condolences. Following the ceremony, the officer I was supposed to hand the flag to approached me and told me not to worry about the mistake I had made. He said that in our upcoming ceremonies, the soul-searing routine would become automatic and that it would get easier for me with each ceremony we performed. He lied. Okay, here's a stupid smart suspender snapping level 9 nerd spreadsheet tip. I know. Microsoft is prehistoric. It's so old. Hey, take it easy there, buddy. Here's a tip. Spreadsheet. Select your data. Press F11. And voila! You have a chart. Yeah, it's in the book. Also, here's a great tip. Drag up and to the left in Excel. Yay!
Hello, my name is Raymond Schaap, and I'm the Confessions of a Level 9 author. <laughs> Cut. Hello, my name is Raymond Schaap, and I'm the author of Confessions book, Full of Confessions. Confessions. <laughs> Cut. My discharge date was closing in on me when I spotted a job announcement pinned up on the sprawling Army Depot's main bulletin board. Cut. Thank you.